Hello friends, I am Ashish Zarbari, founder and CEO of Axomize, and to our new listeners, you're very welcome. And to our old ones, welcome back. We've almost hit the end of the year, and this is probably going to be our last podcast this year, and I thought it might be a nice idea to get the very first guest that I had for my podcast this year, and that is Harry Foster, Chief Scientist of Mentor Graphics. Harry, welcome back again. Thanks. A lot's happened this year. Oh, yeah. And so you've been busy doing a lot of work on the Wilson Research Group Functional Study, and I thought this might be a really good time, end of the year, to take a snapshot of what you've got in the report. Now, I've noticed you've got two different reports, one for FPGA and one for ASIC and IC. So given that our time today might be a little limited, so I looked at both of your reports and I, it looks like the market for ASIC and IC is much bigger than FPGA. So what I'll do is in today's podcast, we'll just focus on that report. But before I do a deep dive in that report, it might be interesting to get your perspective on how do you see the two markets uh, based on your analysis of the FPGA and the ASIC IC. So yeah, in fact, there's an interest, interesting trend that happened in the ASIC market starting in the uh, 2000, mid 2000 timeframe. And that was uh, basically the emergence of SOC class designs, of the, a lot of SOC class designs. And the industry was caught off guard. You can clearly see that in our previous studies that all of a sudden there was a rapid ramping up of a, a maturing of the industry and adopting different type techniques, uh, such as formal, constrained, random, and so on. And then you also saw this increase in uh, verification engineers. So what's happened in the FPGA space is they're going through a similar thing at the moment in terms of growing complexity. Uh, this started about 2012, 2010 to 2012. And you can clearly see in the data that they're going through the same trend. They're being caught off guard. They're being forced to mature. They're starting to add verification teams. But let me make one final comment about the FPGA uh, uh, market segment, in which I think is probably one of the most interesting things we found in uh, the past couple of studies, is that they, they, they don't have a metric like respins like we do in ASIC. So it's hard to assess how good a job are they doing. So we asked a question a couple of years back, did you have a non-trivial bug escape into production? Okay, that's, so that's kind of the closest thing we could come to. It's alarming. 83% of FPGA projects have non-trivial bug escapes into production. Now you think about it, some of those markets like Mail Arrow is a good example. You take the cover off the system, to upgrade the FPGA, the cost is enormous because you've got to revalidate the entire system. So anyway, the FPGA space has a long ways to go. I have to admit, I was really shocked when I read the FPGA one and looking at only 17% success rate, something has got to give. But hey, that was a really good juicy summary of the two. So let's dive into the ASIC side a bit. So, so in your report, you say that the 2019 global semiconductor market was valued at $385.4 billion. And the IC ASIC portion was about 186.6. So I don't quite get what the rest accounts for. Um, what am I missing here? Yeah, so this data, by the way, comes from uh, IC in, uh, Insight report, which uh, the one I think I was reference, referencing at that yeah. point in time was either the April or May report. Mm -hmm. uh, so the rest of the market consists of analog, memory, and microcontrollers. Um, right, okay. And so, so it's important to understand we had a 15% decline in the overall global uh, semiconductor market, but that was really due to memories. Uh, like mm -hmm. we go through this periodic cycle of mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2019, between 2018-2019, we had a 30% decline in, in memory uh, mm. at, at that point in time. Uh, now, what's interesting that's going on now in 2021, the, the latest report hasn't come out, but uh, is that we were expecting memory to recover. It turns out it didn't get any worse, it remained flat. And then the other segments, you know, like analog, microcontrollers, and so on, um, we, we had a slight decline. So we're anticipating, although the report hasn't come out yet, we're anticipating roughly a 3% decline this year. That's significant, and the reason is in our history, 
we've never had back to back declines. So uh, it, it's it's um, not only it's not only due to overcapacity initially in 2018. COVID did have an impact. I mean, it did have a negative impact, as you point out correctly, on the consumer and automotive. But then the networking side and the storage side <laughs> saw a lot of benefits. So nature has its ways of balancing out uh, the things. That's what, <laughs> that's what I believe. So I didn't quite understand the juicy details of the three different biases um, that you talk about in the report. So can you tell me how they creep in? What, what are these different biases and uh, how do you avoid them? Yeah, so typically in survey-based type studies, there's three biases you have to be concerned with. Uh, the first one's non-response bias. The next one is sample validity bias. And the third one is stakeholder bias. And so uh, let me just briefly describe these and then talk about what we, we have done to try to address these. Uh, I'm going to start with the stakeholder bias because uh, that is perhaps one of the most obvious. And this is a case where you have somebody who's got a vested interest in the survey and they uh, decide, okay, I want to take the survey multiple times to try, try to impact the bias, or they hand the survey off to a bunch of their buddies. Ah, so, what we, okay. yeah, so what we do to mitigate that is that when we do an invitation to the survey, a unique number is created that's sent out to that invitation, and it can only be used once so that uh, you can eliminate this bias by uh, stacking the deck, so, so to speak, taking yep. multiple times. Um, Non-response bias is uh, when you have a random sample and you have an individual that couldn't be contacted, maybe due to uh, a aggressive spam <laughs> type filters, or they refuse to contract, uh, just con uh, uh, participate, um, then that's, that's a concern. And we did have that. We, we know we had that this year. We've had it in the past. But we know we had it this year, definitely in North America. Uh, this one you can really only monitor and try to uh, modify the, the sample frame to adjust it. Uh, so what well, uh, what we did, for example, in North America, when the uh, study ended, we ended up extending the study and sending out uh, uh, reminders in North America only. And we got a few more uh, participants that way. Uh, the other, other times in the past, we've monitored certain regions, and uh, there was a couple of years ago we had issues in Japan. What we did was then augment the sample frame the, uh, the participants in the study by going out and querying a specific uh, 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 list essentially from that region to augment, and, and that beefs up the numbers. So realistically, uh, non-response bias, you can only monitor, understand it, and try to augment uh, is the only way you can handle it. And then the uh, other uh, bias that's of concern is uh, sample validity bias. And this is a case where uh, not every member of a population is able to participate in the study. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think the classic example of this was the 1936 uh, United States presidential election, where uh, there was a famous magazine, it was called Library Digest. They went out and did a poll. And the sample frame that they created from this poll consisted of their subscribers, um, as well as uh, phone books and car registrations. The problem with that, that was going on during the Great Depression. And anybody that had money to uh, be a subscriber or a phone or a car, they were a wealthy person. So it was a bias study. They were totally wrong. They, they totally uh, missed who was going to be the next president. And um, uh, it ends out that, end up that uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, who was not projected to win from the study, won only because of uh, sample validity bias in their study. Now, what we do uh, in our studies is, first of all, we don't draw our sample frame from mentor customer lists. That would be a bias study. It would be, uh, you know, this is to the mental world. Uh, we do know that it's represent. Uh, we have participants from like all three major uh, uh, PDA vendors, uh, but we draw. Uh, there's multiple lists, and we look at these very closely to make sure they are representative of every region of the world and every market segment. So that's how we handle sample validity bias. Nice, very nice. So 11% decline in response from North America, but an increase in responses from Europe and India. Now, I was looking at your um, one of the figures which you presented the world map, and I noticed that 
you had some regions colored which looked like East Asia to me. Um, and um, does East Asia include China for you in yes. that report? It does. Okay. Yes, it does. By the way, in, in my in, in some studies, uh, when they say Asia it includes India, I actually pull India out since it's so significant in our uh, um, from the point in, of in view the electro- yeah. of the report. I see. Uh, but China is a surprise. Um, I, China is included in East Asia, but it was a surprise this year because. Uh, I think we should have had higher participation. And Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, at the moment, figure that out, figure out why did we have more participation in China than I anticipated. Yeah, I I was surprised too. And uh, also from South Korea and Japan, I thought they were significant semiconductor presence. Um, But anyway, so what I find quite interesting, and maybe it's purely a coincidence of this being a 2020 pandemic year, that Europe's investment in semiconductors, in my view, is much more than India. And in terms of responses you got, and if an outsider was looking at this report, you'd say, oh, you got 26% of the respondents from Europe and 24% from India. Um, So are they kind of comparable in the size of the market? This doesn't reflect that, though, right? I think they're just more verification engineers in India, so you might have had more responses. Exactly. I mean, um, if you think about it, uh, due to globalization, uh, you know, companies have teams all over the world, and India has a tremendous amount of, of software talent. You know? And if you and, and also if you think about it, uh, a simulation project, the test bench, that's a software project. So uh, uh, naturally, there there is a, a lot of mm-hmm. uh, verification with respect to dynamic techniques sure. in India. So, Harry, what were the last 5% I couldn't gather in the report? Uh, oh, what oh re- the last 5% were, uh, those, that was shaded in gray on, on the yeah, map. Yeah. And, and that was Africa, Mideast, Australia, South America. Uh, and which is interesting because uh, uh, you have to be careful. We use this as a proxy for like uh, where engineering is occurring, but it's, it doesn't necessarily map into silicon uh, uh, revenue. No. For example, in the, in, uh, the Mideast, there's a lot going on in Israel, right? mm-hmm. and certainly in Correct. terms of revenue. Correct. But if you, but if you put it in perspective of projects, it, it's it's smaller compared to you know uh, other regions of the world. No, and this is fascinating because I look at Brazil, uh, Mexico. These are also quite uh, yes. you know big emerging markets for semiconductors. Anyway, so let's talk about this section called verification effectiveness. Um, this is really nice. So. I see your perspective on respins, right? And what you're saying is um, the design complexity has increased, um, and therefore, if the um, respins have also increased, they're kind of catching up with each other. But when I look at it and at that section and say only 32% of the projects are successful in their first attempt, I'm looking at it saying, okay, one in three. That's incredibly poor, given the amount of investment that goes on in verification. Um, what is your thought on this? I mean, do you think it's good enough? Is it better given the increase in design complexity, or would you share my uh, assessment on that? Uh, uh, well, first of all, I always think it's better, but I think the fast uh, it could be better. But the fascinating thing is. Uh, this is almost a constant in our industry because if you go <laughs> if you go back to Colette 2002 yeah. 2004 yeah. uh, they found the same thing so this has been going on for some time I actually had some deep discussions with some colleagues at um, Intel and IBM and they track a lot of metrics too uh, and and they made the same claims uh, with respect to respins and schedules so, you know it's it's almost like a constant in our industry um, and now. We know that design complexity essentially grows at a Moore's law rate. Verification complexity grows at a double exponential rate. Um, you, you could make the argument, uh, if you're an optimist, that, uh, man, it's amazing that we can accomplish what we can accomplish. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I do believe that um, it, it's something everybody should pay attention to because it, 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 it is, it is uh, uh, not particularly good that two-thirds of the projects yeah, um, and yeah. Sort of actually, following on from this, and I just was looking at these numbers in the report. So close to 50% of the bugs discovered are logic bugs, 
and 68% of the designs are behind schedule with greater than 60% of the overall time spent in verification on an average uh, in 2020. And I look at this <laughs> in one sentence and I'm thinking, okay, something is not right here. We're not being very effective. And I, I mean, I, I would expect logic bugs to account for, um, you know, a higher proportion of the bugs found. Um, but what was not clear was what amount of the designs reused the previous IP. And was it because the previous IP was reused, new interfaces, power performance requirements caused that to happen. But no matter how I look at it, it looks like the, the equation isn't quite right in terms of effectiveness. And yeah. I, I wonder if we have learned the lessons or learn them at least effectively enough to say that the methodology process and the training, you know, I think you and I've talked about this a few times, uh, and whether formal methods, if they were used more widely, would it actually make these numbers uh, behave themselves <laughs> effectively? I, uh, well, I, of course, being a formal person, I'm going to say yes, but, but I think, uh, it, I think, uh, to your point, you brought up two interesting things. Uh, well, first, I'm going to back up and say that uh, to me, on these studies, what I think is important is not necessarily the values they reveal, but the questions they raise. Yes. And, and those, those are, um, I think that's the invaluable aspect of, of this. But back to your point, um, I think what's kind of missing at this level of the study and something I would love to know a little bit more is uh, on these respins, uh, what type of design was it in the sense of, was it a new design mm -hmm. or was it just an incremental change in the design? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't have that data. That is something I would really like to know. Sure. The, the, other, the other thing in terms of like, should I be using formal or should I be using constrained random or, or so on? I think a lot of projects really need to do an assessment when they encountered a, a bug. And that assessment is, uh, essentially at what stage did we find this bug and should we have found it at an earlier stage? And if so, what technique would have found that? Yes. I think that analysis is often lost. Yes. And, and without that, it's hard to improve processes. That, that's exactly right. And I, I come across this question and there was, there was quite a, um, an animated and, and exciting discussion in the recently concluded RISC-5 summit about whether we should use formal or whether we should use simulation. And I think what we are all saying is, Think about what, not think about how, you know, yeah. uh, what are we going to verify, et cetera, and then decide in the master verification plan what would be a better suit uh, for uh, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, but I think in general, uh, there is a very uh, dominant simulation mindset, and I come across this so often, even during my training programs, that people have this very rigid way of looking at or we're going to design these agents and the sequences and the transactors and you know this would be and there's so much software engineering based discussion in the test bench architecture that in the middle of all of this the focus on requirements and what are we going to actually verify seems to take a back seat because they just don't have those hours and they're just being discussed in the functional coverage you know when you're trying to close the coverage holes <laughs> that's when it all comes back uh, why we're not closing the coverage but never mind let's move on to another interest no, no, yeah sorry but one comment there because, yeah, I, because uh, it, you're absolutely right. People delve down into the plumbing too quick and, <laughs> yes. and without getting into the what and the how. And by the way, when, when I uh, give lectures on assertions, uh, that's the first thing I, I point out. Let's don't get lost in the syntax and semantics. Let's Absolutely. talk about what we want to check, you know, and then, then I'll show you how to write the assertion. You know? That's the first most important step. So, Harry, um... Now we come to this really interesting section in the report, which is about safety and security. And you pointed out that 10% of the uh, survey said safety bugs, 10% of the bugs were classified as security. And in fact, you said, you know, there's an overlap. So overall, this is more than 100%, all good. I personally believe the situation may be worse than what it was reported, because I think, in the, in the, again, in the case of classification, I'm not sure that everybody is matured enough to classify them separately and often these issues overlap. Um, and I think in many cases, a lot of the security type bugs are discovered as functional bugs. 
and are not even considered factors for impacting security. I consider deadlock as a classic example of this. You know, it could be a functional bug, but strictly speaking, uh, should be seen as a security issue as it impacts the availability aspect of security. So what are your thoughts on this? Do you, do you believe we have, we are still in very early stages of security and safety classification of the bugs, or do you think we are somewhere, you know, you're running at least not walking with it? Uh, we're, de we're definitely in early stages of, of this. And certainly uh, this year was the first year that I actually uh, uh, basically asked that question related of, uh, did, was a bug associated with uh, security and safety? And by the way, typically I don't like to release data on the first year I ask the question. Part of the reason I want to know if uh, potentially something was outside the confidence interval. And I really can't tell that without no. looking at trends. True. Uh, plus, I can't tell if I haven't really architected the question yet. So, so it's, it's um, uh, I, but I went ahead and released it this year and we'll uh, either adjust it next time or we'll have a better insight what goes on uh, next time. But back to your question, one of the problems I see in security is that it's so broad a, a topic. I mean, it spans all aspects of, of the stack from hardware to software. Uh, and so just to say it was a security bug, that's pretty broad. And, and I need to figure out how to narrow that down a little bit. But to your point, um, typically what we find in the industry is that um, a lot of security uh, issues are associated with some sort of functional flaw in the, mm -hmm. in the design where, where the, uh, you know, mean person is taking advantage essentially of some sort of functional flaw. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so, so I think, I think uh, again, I think the bottom line is uh, I need to figure out how to do a better classification of this and, and extract that information. I, I personally feel there should be some educational uh, events to actually educate the wider industry about how these classifications should happen. And in many cases, one bug discovered as a functional bug could actually be reclassified as functional security and safety mm -hmm. uh, or even power. Actually, in my experience working on these microprocessors in the last couple of uh, years, I've certainly seen these patterns. But let's come back to your report. So tuning analog circuits turned out to be not too far behind the logic bugs. So quite a large number of bugs that you picked up in the survey turned out to be analog related. Is it because we had more respondents who were doing analog than digital? Why would analog be such a big issue? Um, so, uh, so that was a big surprise. And uh, again, my first thought, okay, this is something that fell out of the confidence interval. But then I started digging deeper. And what I did is I did analysis over uh, all node sizes. And I did analysis over, and you know, a lot of these node sizes are very old, right? Um, so all the way down to smaller than seven nanometer. Um, and then I also did like a uh, gate count and it didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. So I had a discussion with uh, Brian Bailey at, at Semiconductor Engineering mm -hmm. and he actually went and put together a panel on this because he was suspicious about this too. He wanted to know, is this real? Um, and this was a panel of experts and he published an article back in mid-October on this. And the conclusion was that uh, we're seeing, uh, we're, we're experiencing at the, at the moment an increase of uh, designs uh, that, with more analog as well as pushing the performance of analog. Mm -hmm. And this is what the panel came back. So it really didn't matter what geometry, it didn't matter what the gates uh, count, um, is that we're, we're pushing the envelope at the moment with analog and, and our approaches to analog verification are starting to Oh, very interesting, very interesting. Nice finding, actually. Um, so what I found really fascinating is, you know, we are formal guys and we often complain about specifications and this and not, but you actually got respondents telling you that changing or incorrect or incomplete specifications um, could be a common theme, uh, as you say, often voiced by many verification engineers and project managers. This is very interesting, and I wonder whether this was just completely anecdotal data or whether it was data compiled out of some internal reviews in the in the respective organizations. Any idea on what could be the case as to why people are becoming more vocal and open about it? 
Well, there there are, are certainly are some market segments where it's becoming a lot more important. Uh, for example, functional safety, uh, and and not, when I'm talking about functional safety, I'm not just talking about automotive. Uh, uh, we're seeing industrial mm -hmm. uh, growing Correct. quite a bit, uh, mm -hmm. robotics, and, and as well as mail air has been been mm -hmm. around. And so, so specification is is becoming. Uh, uh, yeah. As well as the processor guys have been doing specs, uh, serious specification. For, for yeah, my hunch was, so, yeah, my hunch was the same as yours. It, it might have to come from the safety requirements. It's, it's coming more from the liability side rather than the reliability side. And Yeah, so uh, I, I think, that, by the way, I think the interesting thing in the study, um, so that, those were significant, the, the fact that what was causing the uh, uh, logical uh, functional flaws was associated change in spec, incorrect, incorrect spec, and, and so on. Uh, what uh, what's interesting? So it's a significant amount in, for ASICs, but if you look at the FPGA, there is something interesting going on there. It, everything we uh, increased, whether it was uh, um, basically a design error, uh, a change in the spec, a, a um, an incorrect spec, change in the uh, error in the internal IP, error in external. Everything was increasing over time. Just another indication of growing complexity in the FPGA space. And by the way, um, in automotive, uh, there's a there's a lot more ASIC done than FPGA. However, in mail aero, there's a lot more FPGA done than uh, uh, ASIC. And and the theme is common. Everybody is appreciative of the fact that specifications are going to play a more important role than they have played in the past, which is awesome. <laughs> which is a first step in the right direction. Let's talk about verification effort, Harry. So this section is again extremely fascinating. So it looks like the verification headcount increased at twice the rate of design headcount at the outset. But then in some areas like processor verification, the ratio is five is to one. Um, that is quite significant actually. So if I spend five times as much on verification than on design, and yet happen to be in the region of 68% of the projects that run behind schedule or end up having to respin, <laughs> That should kill my business opportunity, no? <laughs> I should be out of business. That's scary thought, right? If you look at it like this, I've, I've literally just looked at the numbers in different sections of the report. Um, and I'm not yeah, even... But, but, pause, yeah. but pause there a minute, because um, uh, let me, let me uh, comment, because uh, if you talk about processors, um, there's a huge amount of revenue in there. They learned early on that uh, it was going to cost too much to have bug escapes, right? Correct. Uh, not not all industries can afford that five to one ratio, and and so uh, right now we're pretty close at a one to one ratio, but that's ag aggregated across all market segments. Mm -hmm. There's some market segments that have zero verification engineers, you know, design engineers. So, yeah. so again, you have to kind of tie that to um, you know uh, basically the revenue of, of the. No, this is a very good point, Harry, um, that traditionally the industry was kicked off from processors and this has been the oldest um, IP segment, if I may use the word IP here. Um, but this should also be an eye opener for the RISC-V market, of course, because um, there's, there's a flurry of so many different vendors and if they aren't going to invest as much in verification, um, then God help. Um, but just one second, I was thinking of, um, yeah, so just looking at two different sections of the report, um, the 10% of the bugs were classified as safety and 10% as security. Though in terms of explicitly building safety and security, we see that 42% of the designs are working on one or more safety requirements, according to the report, and 54% on security. Does this mean that the verification quality is so good for safety and security that in terms of bugs found only 10% account for these? And however, in some cases like security, almost half of the projects are working on security. So I, I think that my point here is that the bug classification is not right. Um, but somewhere here, the responses don't seem to line up either. Uh, yeah, to, to your point, uh, um... Uh, I, I agree with that. It, in fact, I was a little bit surprised uh, when we got the data back related to uh, flaws contributing to respin, uh, especially with security and safety. Uh, since this, but this was the first year of asset, and again, I don't know if there's a 
problem in, in the study this year, since it was the first year, uh, th this very well could be out of whack. The other thing that I'm suspicious over is the uh, percentage of projects, again, this is not silicon volume, this is projects, uh, a, a percentage of projects that are uh, claimed to be working on safety. Uh, I haven't been able to hammer that down. Uh, I got 42%, but that was a decline from what I'd seen in previous sites, which I suspected was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something, um, um, again, we kind of use these as a proxy of where the industry is sure. at, uh, but that's something I'm trying to uh, get a better hand on. Um, so, so anyway, to kind of summarize that, uh, I'm, I'm real cautious about putting a stake in the ground on, on the bugs. Is, is it 10% or is that uh, even a misunderstanding on the participants? Yeah. yeah, and actually another uh, related question is 62% of the market is for automotive. And yet in the safety-oriented projects, we are saying only 42%. And I can't believe you could be shipping into the automotive segment without complying with the ISO 26262 functional safety. So those numbers don't match up either. <laughs> So, well, that, that could be a misunderstanding in the way I worded the report. Um, okay. Let me explain that. Yeah, uh, sure. What I, claim, what I cl claimed is that 42% um, uh, 40, uh, of participants in the study, that's projects in the study, uh, um, claimed that they were working uh, on what, under one of these functional safety type standards. Mm -hmm. Now, within that group, 62% were automotive. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, okay, so, okay. So, I so, see. And, uh, so I was I was doing that with respect to automotive, not across all market segments. Ah. So if I was going to do it across nice. all market segments, I'd have to multiply 62 okay. times 42. Oh, that helps. Small numbers. That helps. That helps. So I certainly misread this. <laughs> so good. Thank you very much for the clarification. So let's talk about debug, right? Our favorite topic. So everybody spends a lot of time debugging. Looks like 41% of the time is spent in debug. I would have expected to see a little bit more, but never mind. I read the next thing, which is 43% of the time is spent in test bench development, of which 24% is in creating tests and running simulation. So if I add these numbers up, this looks pretty, pretty bad actually, <laughs> in the sense that if I'm spending 41% in debug, and if I'm spending about 43% time in test bench development, right? And of which 24% is in creating tests and running simulation, we could actually avoid all of this, really. I'm thinking formally, really. Um, because if you think of 24, which is more like 25, 24, so one fourth of my time, um, is this spent in creating tests. If I was doing a 12 month project, I end up spending three months creating tests and running simulation. I wouldn't do that with formal. That does seem a little odd, but I don't know if these statistics are again, absolutely accurate or just an indicative. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, if, uh, if I'm doing formal, uh, the and once you're an experienced formal guy, most of that time is actually uh, kind of you know, running, the, running the tool, right? A, a, as well as uh, figuring out how to solve some potential type of uh, state explosion problem. Uh, but, and the, and, and the bulk of your time is in debug. Yes, let's face it. That's right. Uh, uh, and so, in fact, um, a couple of years ago, uh, not related to formal, but uh, to the point about debug, I, I went and visited uh, this engineering manager, really bright guy. Uh, it was one of the brightest teams that I've ever visited. And we were discussing debug, and he, he said that they spend 83% of the time in debug. And I said, wow, that's that's higher than what I'm seeing the rest of the industry. You know, what's going on? And he said, well, if you think about it, we've optimized our verification environment. Uh, and so we spend very little time in terms of creating the environment and the tests and stuff. That's become almost push button. Uh, we would spend a bulk of our time in debug, right? Uh, so, so it's kind of like that way in formal too. You are spending most of your time in debug in, in a in formal world. Now, the the caveat to that is that from a man management perspective, I can gather all these uh, statistics uh, on these different processes, and I can use that to basically try to figure out in the future what resources I'm going to need. The insidious aspect is debug because it varies so much, particularly in this, uh, like in simulation world, 
uh, you might encounter a bug that takes, you know, a couple hours, a couple days, or some that uh, takes a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very difficult from a planning perspective. You know, mm -hmm. you, you kind of put an average of sink in the ground, but you might be really off on that. Correct. Correct. I, I certainly believe the number uh, upon debug is, needs to be higher. And also, there is no mention of how much time is spent in coverage closure. Um, that's not captured. Um, uh, yeah, in fact, if you think about it, uh, debug, uh, quite often debug is associated with uh, a coverage closure. Ah, so this is yeah. actually including the time spent in coverage closure, is it? Yeah, okay. yes, yes. I um, see. Um, and, um, <clears throat> it, it, you know, because uh, coverage closure is a debug problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking debug as, you know, when you get the failures, test fail or assertions fail, and then you spend that time in debug. And then... Yeah, I, I probably should... Um, ask a question, how much time are you spending? We, we do know, I do have data, I'm not sure if I put that in the report, we do know that it is um, the biggest challenge in the industry is, is closing coverage. Yeah. yeah. And, but I, I don't have uh, data on how much time is actually spent. I probably should add that. Sure, yeah. All right, let's talk about design trends. So 68% of the ASIC projects are using embedded processors and 48% have two or more and 17% have eight or more. And now you're throwing cache coherent fabrics in this and adding safety and security. Um, sounds like a lot of fun for verification. Um, <laughs> and, and, and what I found really liberating in this is 23% of the SOC projects have used RIS-5. So like one in four SOC projects that your report surveyed are actually already using RIS-5. That is Quite impressive, actually, from RIS V's point of view, in in the way that RIS V has seen the adoption so quickly. Um, uh, it was a surprise to me. Yeah. Uh, but keep in mind, I can't show trends because this is the first year of asset. Correct. But that correct. did that did come out as a surprise. And let me also comment: I don't know how the RIS V was used. Correct. It could have been, you know, like the primary processor. It might have been a service processor. Correct. Correct. Not very complex. Like in GPU's case, yes, indeed. And actually, the AIs also stood out that 27% um, were AI-based. And again, it's a really nice addition to the report to follow these design trends. Would be nice to actually get a split of, um, probably there is somewhere else maybe, how much x86 and ARM and RISC-5 and how this market is changing. Both again- Yeah, I'm sure that somebody has, has uh, done that type of analysis. Uh, uh, and and um, a, a good point. By the way, so I kind of have to limit the scope of the questions because it takes 35, 40 minutes to take this. So whenever I'm adding something new, I'm stepping back. What do I need to take away? Correct, correct. But actually, one thing that struck me out was that this headcount ratio of five is to one for processor verification. Is this now you're having a bias because there are a lot more processor people like the, you know, a uh, quarter of these from RISC five. Do you think that might have actually created a bias in the results? Because um, I, so what I did is I, I basically took the headcount and I filtered it down to market segment processors only. Oh, I see. And so with, mm. within that, that okay. was the ratio I was seeing. I can, I can filter it down to any any type of market segment that I'm studying. Okay. And and then uh, determine the, uh, the ratio. Okay. So, uh, so I don't think it actually. Uh, impact of the overall. Um, keep in mind, it's been a constant, right? Uh, well, well, no, we are seeing uh, it's it's become one to one recently. In the past couple of years, it's been a constant. Yeah, no, that that helps because I was thinking if you get more processor people in the room, then obviously your numbers would <laughs> swing in that direction more. So let's talk about verification adoption trends. So this is interesting. So the growth in adoption of automatic formal apps is about fifteen percent. Uh, compared to 2016, while the increase in formal property checking is about 10% from 2016. Um, and this is 10% overall from 2016 to 2020, or is it 10% every year? I think it's overall, right, for the four year oh, period? Oh, 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 overall from that. Uh, okay. I, I have calculated the CAGR, uh, which I don't know off the top of my mm -hmm, head. But... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think in. Oh, in by the, the way, let me comment on that. Yeah. Because uh, what's not reflected in the graph there is I, I do studies every two years, and those are four-year cycles. Right. Uh, th there's an interesting trend going on here, which is that we see this increase 
and then we plateau for four years and then we see an increase. This has been going on for <laughs> a number of years now. So there, I don't know if that's tied to, um, you know, a, a lot of adoption of formal tend to be much more mature projects like processes and stuff. And, and they typically have longer cycles, like, uh, you know, three months or, or so. So yeah. that, that might be why we're seeing the, that kind of step function type of increase. Actually, one thing that also stood out in the report was that in another graph, in the, you know, you're saying that, um, it, you know, in simulation, um, assertion-based verification was used. So that number is much higher. It's about 75% in figure 20. Um, and yet the, you know, formal property checking is much smaller. So it looks to me fairly sensible, um, but it looks like the simulation-based verification has adopted assertions as a useful way to complement. Um, but in terms of pure formal property checking, the adoption is still, uh, I suppose, on 30% mark, right? 35% uh, yes. overall. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this, this exactly. seems to make sense. Um, for emulation and FPGA, I didn't see any information on how much time it takes to debug. Um, and I was going to ask you this question when we were talking about debug in the simulation uh, context. So do you have any data points on typically how much time users are spent in debugging emulation? Uh, not uh, not from the study, just anecdotally. The, uh, the big problem, uh, emulation is less of a problem these days. Uh, it's, it's almost as, you know, it's basically you're using the same things as simulator uh, debug environment. Uh, the problem is observability and FPGA prototyping. And, and so that that is significantly higher the, the amount of time, but I don't know uh, like percentages or anything. That's something I didn't study. Yeah, that would be quite useful to know because I know from colleagues who've been doing emulation, you get a failing trace. It could be two, three weeks. Uh, again, this is full SOC emulation, not a subsystem. Uh, yeah, in fact, I probably should. Uh, I probably should do a, a deeper type. Um, portion of the study related debug, break it out by, right now I'm just seeing what percentage, I should break it out by uh, what type of uh, environment you're using, formal. Uh, no, no, we have seen published papers on that. Uh, for example, uh, Sun uh, published paper back in 2008, I believe it was, where they were showing uh, the percentage of time that being spent in debug related simulation versus formal. It was significantly different. It was mm -hmm. a dramatically drop in. Uh, this is a 2008 in paper? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 2008. It was uh, uh, at DAC. Um, DAC. Okay. I'll, I'll look it up and send it to you. Yeah, yeah. And I'll let the, the mm. users uh, find out about it. But hey, it's overall very interesting. And coming this year when all of us have been closeted at home, thank you very much, Harry, for all the hard work you and the team did for this report. I've certainly learned a lot. And I believe um, people who are going to read your report or would find it interesting and some who haven't already might find it interesting to go back and look at it after they hear us talk about it. So thank you very much for your time, Harry, today. Thank you. Hey, listeners, I hope you loved today's chat. I certainly did. And I would like to take this opportunity to wish you a very happy Christmas and a lovely new year where we can all be out and about. But until then, stay safe and take care. Bye.